Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, so I think this is uh, this talk will be very different from all the other talks that you are doing here uh, today. So basically, as, as Joseph mentioned, uh, I have done most of my work uh, in the health context or clinical trial design context. But uh, as we both feel that uh, you know, a lot of the concepts might translate to the education context as well. So let's see what you think. Okay, so uh, we call this dynamically personalized interventions. I will introduce the concepts. And then we'll talk about a special experimental design called uh, sequential multiple assignment randomized trial. We call it SMART for short. And uh, so this uh, design has quite a bit of unique feature that might be helpful in, in a lot of different contexts. And I'll also, um, you know, time permitting, I'll, I'll try to show some analysis results of a real SMART study data in the context of smoking cessation, behavioral intervention for smoking cessation. Um, and then we'll wrap, wrap it up. Okay, so just to define the concept, uh, this is, uh, these interventions are individually tailored treatments with treatment type and dosage changing over time according to an individual's ongoing responses to the interventions. So, you know, it could take uh, into account the adherence, burden, side effects, and so on. Right. So uh, this is a this is a uh, unique paradigm where it recognizes that individuals are different, and so that's why it personalized and also it it emphasizes the fact that individuals change over time. So that's why the dynamic aspect comes into play. And there are many other names in many different fields, intellectual very, very different intellectual fields, and you know uh, people have called it by adaptive interventions, adaptive treatment strategies, um, treatment policies. Uh, in the statistics world, we mainly call it dynamic treatment regimes or regimens. Um, people also call it stepped care models, expert systems, recommender systems. But, but the key idea is, is always the same, that it's, it's a dynamic thing and it's an individualized thing. OK, so uh, I'll give you a, a real example in the context of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So these are some real treatment scenarios and I have given the reference uh, over there. So here, children with ADHD, how would you treat them? And there are a few possibilities. You can you know, potentially, at the first stage, you can try a behavioral modification therapy or some low intensity medication. And then, at at a after, after a specific predefined period, maybe maybe a few weeks, um, you can assess whether they are a responder or a non-responder to the initial treatment. And based on that evaluation, you might want to change their treatment. So, if they are responder, potentially you can continue with the same same treatment. And then, if they are adjudged a non-responder, then you can either intensify the existing treatment or you may do an augmentation with, with a different treatment. So that is the basic idea. And of course, this responder, non-responder assessments has to be properly defined. And in this context, they often do it. Uh, in, in fact, I'll mention a real study around this concept. And they used a teacher-rated uh, impairment scaling of the, of the children. OK, so in, in this scenario, what is a, dynamic personalized intervention. So you follow the red arrows on the screen. So that define one dynamic personalized intervention. Um, so it starts with, with low intensity behavioral modification therapy, continues it with uh, for responders. And for non-responders, it just adds the med medication. So that's one example. There are many other, um, there are a few other DPIs you know, that are embedded in this in this uh, picture. So the obvious question is why? And this is, uh, again, this is a paradigm shift from one size fits all to, you know, recognizing that people are different and people change over time. And, you know, basically, a lot of the, a lot of the why, why is that uh, essentially the justification for personalized medicine or personalized interventions 
um, precision medicine, whatever you call it. So the, the key thing is that more is not always better. More treatment is not always better. You have to tailor the treatment according to the need of the individuals, according to the need of the patients or students or whatever context you are in. Okay. So the big scientific questions here is that, okay, how do you evaluate, how do you, uh, uh, how do you assess the, the mean outcome? If, if you are thinking in terms of continuous measurement, then what would be the mean average outcome uh, if the population were to follow a certain kind of intervention? And then the next natural question is, how do you compare between two or more such interventions? Um, and then finally, you know, you may want to do a bit more deep uh, personalization by, you know, thinking about what are the other covariates and other characteristics of the individual that you can utilize to, you know, find out more optimal uh, interventions for every single individual. So in an in a ideal world, you collect all the information from the individual and then create based on these rules that you learn from the data. Uh, then you they recommend what is the best best intervention for that individual in in question. And when it comes to statistics, the main questions are what is the right kind of data, and that is that is the context where I'll talk about you know smart design, sequential multiple assignment randomized trials. Is it generalization of the classical randomized trial design, and then. Um, you know, some of the primary and secondary analysis of that kind of data. Um, and in particular, very briefly touch base on a, a concept called Q-learning, even though I would not show any, any algorithm, any equations, nothing. Um, but basically, it is a stage-wise learning procedure that came out of computer science, but now adapted in the statistics world and further developed. OK, so. We are talking about the discovery of DPI and how do you do it by experimental data, right? So of course, um, it is well known from the causal infer inference perspective that experimental data are better than observational data. Of course, there is a cost aspect to it, but if you can afford it, that you should always go with experimental data. And um, the standard randomized trials, they are developed to assess the effectiveness of one single treatment of, uh, with a single dosage and compared to another. But when you are talking about sequences of treatments in a dynamic fashion, uh, you have to think about it from a longitudinal uh, point of view. Then the question is, can you do it by a series of single stage randomized trials, the classical old fashioned randomized trials that we know? Can you just stitch together results from different randomized trials? So let's uh, go through an example to see uh, whether we can do it or not, right? So now I am moving to an example from depression. Um, so the goal here is to compare both the frontline and second line treatment for managing major depression. And again, I will be talking in terms of two stages of intervention. So the frontline treatment options are, uh, okay, maybe I just go to the, Picture, yeah. Frontline options are citalopram, a, a drug, or CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, it's a psychological um, therapy. So these are the treatment options at the first stage. And then the second stage option for non responders, people who do not respond to the initial stage of treatment, what to do with them. So the treatment options are the, among the citalopram non responders are either CBT or lithium. And then for CBT non-responders, the treatment options are citalopram or lithium. And then the responders always get the usual maintenance kind of therapy. Okay. So you know the highlighted parts are the, the potential comparisons that we want to make. Right? What are the what are the best? Uh, what is the best uh, first line treatment and what is the best second line treatment? Okay. So the first line line front line comparison. And suppose we observe a 60% of the response rate with citalopram and only 50% response rate with CBT. Just consider response, non-response, a binary outcome. So from this observation, you might conclude that citalopram is the best frontline therapy. 
So then you might argue, you know, uh, from the very basic uh, consideration that okay, citalopram is already looking good here, and then I don't need to go the go into the pathway following the CBT. Maybe I just go um, from citalopram and I do another study, another randomized study among the non-responders of citalopram, right? So, so then for that, uh, for that part, suppose you observe 40% response rate to the, uh, to the CBT and 20% to the lithium among the non-responders of citalopram. Right? So from this comparison, you would, co you would conclude that CBT is the best second line therapy, right? Because it gives more. So the final treatment sequence, final adaptive uh, uh, dynamic intervention sequence, that would be citalopram followed by CBT for non-responders. And then under this, this dynamic uh, intervention, you would expect to see 76% of the patients respond. 76% comes out of this 60% this, uh, from here, and then 40% uh, of the another, another remaining 40%. So that's 76% total. So that's your, you know, that's the optimal sequence you would recommend by this kind of design strategy. But is it really correct? So that's the thing. Okay, so there is this concept about delayed effects of interventions, right? So what if the initial treatment with cognitive behavioral therapy increases treatment adherence, which might, which might help uh, the subsequent treatments to be more successful? So in that case, uh, if, you, if you just follow that CBT here, 50%, but then among the non-responders of CBT, the, if you give citalopram, there is a 60% response. So 50% and then another 60% another of that. So if you add up to this 50%, that would lead to 80% response rate overall. So it, it, you would be better off if you start with CBT, even though in the, in the short term, taking a myopic vision, it, it might look worse, but by doing it, by choosing CBT first, you might do better off if you follow it up by citalopram. So that's the concept of dynamic personalized intervention. And basically, you know, what you look short term may not be the optimal when you look at the sequence. Right? Okay, so uh, basically then th this kind of consideration led to the, the introduction of the smart concept. It looks very simple. But uh, it's actually a powerful idea that okay, you put all these things together, do a trial with the, with the, with the same people over the stages, and uh, and in fact, uh, Susan Murphy, who was sort of the inventor of this concept, uh, uh, who happens to be my PhD supervisor, uh, she she has been in in the University of Michigan and now moving over to Harvard. Uh, so she won the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant for uh, for inventing this concept of smart design um, in 2013. So basically, these are multi-stage trial designs with the development with the goal of developing such uh, dynamic personalized interventions. You have to you have to have same set of subjects participate throughout the different stages. I have given only an example of two stages, but conceptually you can do it more stages if, if you like and if you can, if you have the infrastructure for it. Um, and each stage would correspond to a treatment decision. Each stage uh, is randomized, and then randomization may be uh, restricted based on ethical grounds. For example, if someone is a, is a non responder to a certain treatment, you would not definitely be re-randomizing them again to that same treatment options in the next stage. So these considerations are all allowed within this design framework. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier when I gave you the ADHD example, there is actually a, a real trial um, that was done uh, and, and basically they randomized these options um, here and here and here. And the primary outcome was the teacher-rated impairment scaling, uh, impairment rating scale of 
um, of the students at the end of the trial. Uh, there are some other examples from various areas, you know, schizophrenia, depression, cancer, smoking cessation, alcohol dependence, and, 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 and there are a lot more, more recent examples you will find in this website I have given, um, uh, hosted by the Meteorology Center at Penn State University. And in particular, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that smoking cessation study and uh, show you some results. Um, okay. So um, now the question is when you have data from such a smart study, um, and the smart study, we did the personalization at a very crude level in, in the sense that we categorized people into responder versus non responder. That's a in a way, low dimensional summary of a high dimensional uh, individual, right? Because every individual has a lot of individual characteristics. So when you have the data, you may want to do a bit of machine learning kind of uh, approach to learn a bit more about, you know, what is the best option for one particular individual. Of course, at the design stage, that might be difficult to do. But when you have the data from the design, then you can do the analysis and then do the learning and make a recommendation for future. So in this con uh, context, there is this method called Q-learning that came out of the reinforcement learning literature in computer science. Uh, reinforcement learning, for those of you who are, um, you know, I guess many of you are from computing, uh, School of Computing, so um, it may be familiar, but for others, it's a, it's a concept, uh, it's an area within artificial intelligence and you know, historically it was used for robotics and so on. But, but uh, even in this health context, we found it very useful. And uh, again, in the, in the statistics world, it was, it was implemented using some kind of stage-wise regression. And um, I will show you some results where basically we did standard, uh, uh, standard linear regression. However, you can, if you, if you want to be, make it more sophisticated, you can do you know, all kinds of machine learning um, techniques you can apply within this system. And then we have developed an R package uh, to implement it and do analysis. Okay, so the example that I uh, wanted to talk to you about is a smoking cessation trial called Project Quit. It was conducted at the University of Michigan. And this is basically a two-stage web-based uh, behavioral intervention therapy for helping people quit smoking. And this was a more complicated trial. Uh, you know, it has a very, uh, how should I say? It, it was quite complicated. It has a fractional factorial design um, at the stage one and, and a simpler uh, randomized trial option at the second stage. But, you know, um, I'll be looking at a simplified aspect of it, I would not go into all different aspects. So uh, here stage one intervention is basically, you know, a tailoring of success story of successful quitters of smoking. So this is an online behavioral messaging system, right? And then basically people were told stories about people who successfully quit smoking. And um, so the treatment, the variation in that uh, treatment was whether or not the, the, the fictitious character in, in that story is tailored to the individual who is getting that intervention versus a more generic character. Right? So that's tailoring of success story, high versus low tailoring. And this study was focused to address the, the behavioral aspect of smoking cessation. So the pharmacological aspect was already addressed by giving them nicotine patch and so on. And the, the covariate of interest that I, I'll, I'll be looking at is, is education, uh, whether or not they have a high school degree. Uh, so that, you know, we want to investigate whether education level of, of an individual, of a participant, has an impact on, on you know, the treatment that they're uh, getting, whether there's a treatment, treatment by covariate interaction uh, for them. And the outcome that we are looking at is a month's non-smoking over, over a 12-month period. And the second stage, they are getting a booster prevention or a control of a follow-up treatment. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, 
this study has this kind of a smart structure again this is the simplified version i'm not going through the full details but basically if you look at this one treatment component it is high versus low tailoring randomized and then again uh, booster prevention or control but this is as i mentioned this is coming from a fractional factorial design so there are many other treatment components given there but because of the factorial structure we can use all the data and just focus on this intervention which came out to be the most significant in the primary analysis of the study um, yeah, I think I already talked about it. So basically, individualization of um, of the effect, and um, so we did a Q learning analysis on this data set, and uh, the results are actually quite interesting. We found that there's a negative coefficient for tailoring versus education, um, and it says that highly individually tailored level of story uh, is more effective for subjects with lesser education so if you try to interpret it then why why is it so so the uh, interpretation goes like this uh, basically people with high education uh, tend to be skeptical about uh, you know these kind of interventions and so on whereas um, people who with lower education level they 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 Connect. They are less skeptical people, and they, they connect very well with with the, with the with the fictitious character easily. And if if they can connect, that makes a real difference, and that's what translates to their you know change of behavior. Whereas um, you know for very highly educated people, um, you know tailoring high versus slow doesn't really make much of a difference. So that was um, the finding, and that was actually consistent with the results from the primary analysis of that data set that was essentially a logistic regression. So uh, this is a very good sanity check because you know by doing Q learning kind of thing, at the end of the day, we also got something that is more straightforward and people can understand and the results were all consistent. Okay, so uh, coming towards the end, I just want to summarize the the gains and losses uh, associated with this smart design. Um, of course, it offers the ability to detect the delayed therapeutic effects, treatment interactions, um, and then some diagnostic effects. Um, so these are some of the good things that you would not get in a, in a regular randomized trial. You would miss those effects. Then you can also argue that smart designs are uh, generally uh, could be more generalizable than standard RCT because standard randomized trials, they have a narrow um, inclusion criteria because they want to focus and they do not allow a lot of treatment, a uh, lot of variability in outcome. Whereas um, uh, here in the smart context, we appreciate that people are different. And so the trials are designed in a way to accommodate these differences among people. Also, um, you know, one can argue that this kind of designs has better recruitment and retention potential compared to a standard RCT. Uh, why is that so? Because you know, if you think from a patient point of view or a participant point of view, um, so basically in a standard randomized trial, if you are randomized to something, some treatment that does not work for you, for your lifestyle and so on, then you don't have much of an option. You have to just stop taking the treatment or you have to drop out of the study or just do not comply, right? Whereas if you are in a smart, then you know that, okay, if I fail in my first attempt, meaning the first treatment I'm randomized to, if I fail on that, I'll have a second chance. I'll, I'll get, I'll be re-randomized to something else, not, not the same one. So from a patient or, or a participant point of view, that is appealing and we argue that it should help with the recruitment and retention of people. And then these kind of designs should be viewed as developmental trials rather than confirmatory trials. So what do I mean by that? That means this is for finding a, a, a dynamically personalized intervention, what would be good and then once you find it from, once you learn about it from the analysis of smart data, then you should follow it up 
with a standard RCT for confirmation purposes. In that case, you take the optimal TPI learned from the smart data and compare it with a suitable control or you know standard of care or whatever existing methodology you have, you, you run a head-on comparison using a standard RCT. So that could be one way to look at it. Um, and here are some of the costs. Um, so uh, of course, this is if you have to do this multi-stage randomization, this will be generally more expensive, longer follow-up time. Um, if you are really keen to compare the treatment sequences and you want to power the trial based on that, then you will need more, more patient, more, more participants. Sample size will be a bit higher. However, there are more, uh, there are uh, less expensive alternatives to, to power the trial. So, in other words, you don't necessarily have, for the powering purposes, you don't necessarily have to compare the full sequences. You may just argue that okay I'll, I'll do my powering of the trial based on the first stage comparison and not the full sequence um, and some people have actually done it successfully conducted uh, smart studies in this way and in fact the ADHD trial I mentioned they recruited only 155 subjects which is pretty modest I would say um, and then you know analysis methods are more complex cutting edge so it requires an experienced statistician to anal analyze the data or you know someone who has time to learn new methods um, from in, in terms of funding getting getting it getting such proposals approved there is also a bit of work involved because you know the funders may, may be relatively unfamiliar about this uh, newer design concepts and they may be skeptical uh, maybe unsure about the implications, so it might uh, need some work. And and uh, you know, this is even though it looks up similar to the classical crossover design, which some of you may be familiar with, it is conceptually different. You know, in the smart design, uh, we we want to compare these treatment sequences. That's the ultimate goal. Whereas crossover trials aim to Evaluate standalone treatments in a single point. You just uh, they cross over and add more information. Uh, and then, unlike in a crossover trial, treatment allocation in SMART is typically adaptive to the subject's intermediate outcome. Whereas in an in a crossover trial, the treatment sequences do not depend on how patients respond. And crossover trials attempt to wash out the so-called carryover effect or delayed effect. Whereas in SMARTs. We precisely want to capture that delayed effect. So conceptually, it's quite different. Um, and um, there is also another concept called adaptive experimental design in, in statistics and is used in other contexts. Basically, these adaptive experimental designs are um, those where you know, some of the design elements, for example, the randomization probabilities change over time during the course of the trial as you accrue more and more information. Um, uh, which is actually eth uh, ethically appealing, but um, so but these two concepts are different. Um, in the classical adaptive experimental design, it's a concept of between subject adaptation, whereas within the smart design that I talked about, it's an within subject adaptation of information. Uh, however, a combination of the two concepts uh, is a topic of current research, and we have recently, uh, well, not so recent, but couple of years back, we have published a paper on, on this one, um, combining the ideas of smart and adaptive randomization. So I just want to uh, finish by saying that, OK, this DPI is offer a framework for operationalizing and thus potentially improving adaptive decision making that is uh, happening in many different fields, including education. Even though I don't have any example in education, I think this, um, this translates well. Uh, and then, you know, sample size formulas are available for trial for powering the trial. And uh, people often think that okay, this is awfully complicated. We'll need a lot of sample size, but not necessarily. I mean, there are ways to, you know, uh, give a reasonable sample size estimate. And uh, I talked about Q learning for analysis of such smart data that can help you, you know, deeply uh, develop deeply tailored interventions. And there are software available for that. Uh, 
okay here is my book that uh, just mentioned this is a bit technical statistically heavy but you know if you if you want to know a bit more more about these designs there's a chapter on it which is relatively less technical okay and i'm happy to collaborate i'll be very excited if someone from, from the education or social sciences want to do such a study and i'm just an email away okay thank you Uh, in the health context, I have seen a maximum of you know three to four stages. Um, but I think uh, if you are in a different domain, if the treatments are not that expensive, or you know if you can evaluate things quickly, you can conceptually you can grow as much as you as you want. Um, so one thing that seems like an exciting opportunity here um, would be to think about how these techniques might be applied to the problem of what impacts, actually. Because um, we were just talking about how it is that in identifying new potential learning paths through mm -hmm. a complex yeah. space where there might be one that people haven't tried yet, that, you, okay. know, yeah. you can't just randomly sample and um, add their major consequences for people. So you might want to kind of um, it seems like this is a good way of mitigating the risk because you get to help somebody right away with something. You mm. have a backup plan. You're trying right. to do it as efficiently. Right. Yeah. You're trying to minimize how many people are negatively impacted yes. by yes. such yeah. risk. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just I'm wondering about your thoughts about that. It seems like that would be, you know, the connections. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think you're totally right, and that's what you know Joseph and I were, were talking about. I think that's that's why he felt that you know uh, having me give this talk might. Might help, you know, some of the people thinking along along these lines. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I have to read your book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I just requested a new slide with your digital copies. So when you ask, I just requested a new slide to get the new copies. When you ask, was trying to ask them as well. You can't. Yeah. Yeah, but I just want to add that you know that's a bit technical, written for statistical audience. But you know, there are also many many papers. Uh, which talks about these kind of designs, which are written for psychologists or uh, social scientists. So I think that might be more accessible in certain ways. If you send, if you send us a link to those papers and social scientists, you can put them on the website. Oh, it's pretty technical, but it's always good to yeah, 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 right, well. of course, yeah. Uh, sure. question. Some of your trees, yeah. some of uh, interventions that were in parallel. Right. So yeah. when you say, for example, CBT is used on two different branches. Uh, in, in your adaptive pathways, do you consider those completely independent? So that uh, the second stages, if there's uh, there's similar outcomes, do you take into account that uh, the observation in one branch might actually have a help in, in determining uh, another branch's success rate? So um, that, like so in this picture, you have yeah. uh, two cases where behavior modification therapy and medicine right. are both used as second uh, in the secondary lines, right? right. So it, it's possible that let's say uh, in, in one area uh, the success rate would have some information gained or, or some some uh, help in determining the success on the other other branch as well. Uh, yes, because that's the delayed effect, right? That's the delayed effect concept I talked about. So basically, yeah, uh, I think the example that I, no, maybe the other example. So basically, if you get the behavioral intervention here, and then uh, maybe that will help your adherence and so on, and that might affect your success to future treatments. Yes, that's that's very much possible. So these two branches, uh, at both stage, and meds, are not as statistically independent of each other. They're not traditionally independent. Uh, they are different in terms of the history that they got. Right. But here at this stage, they both get here, but they got through different pathways. So this one, these people got made medicine first, and then they got the behavioral component here added to their medicine. Right. Whereas these people got the behavioral thing first, and here medicine added, right? So right. that's the conceptual difference. But yeah, I understand the ordering is different. Uh, right. Your model allow for any effects where uh, the posterior is informed by you know, just having the two treatments be the same. So okay, so if you are uh, if you are interested in the comparison of 
uh, a combination therapy versus intensification of therapy uh, among among the non responders to the first stage treatments then you can combine this group and this group together well, and also this group and this group together. So it all depends on the research question, but the modeling allows you to combine them or look at them differently. Okay. So it depend, depends on your research question. Okay. Well, whereas if your question is that, okay, uh, among the non-responders to behavioral modification therapy, whether these two are different, then of course you cannot combine this group with this group, right? So then you basically focus on this part of the study. Whereas if your goal is, comparison of uh, combination therapy and intensification of therapy among the first stage non-responders without specifying the first stage treatment, then you can combine these two. So then you can take them together. Right. And that would be more akin to the crossover study where you can work right. Work, right? right. Let's say you had a third branch, yeah. right? And you and in the third branch um is the low uh, behavior modification that that is let's say you have a third option. And then later that upscales into the same type of uh, secondary treatment using behavior modification and methods. Uh, it is, it does the model allow some predictive capability to say that in that third branch, that, that secondary treatment will also be predicted to have a certain outcome or certain evidence based on observations from the other two branches? Um, so third branch, uh, the first line treatment is what? Yes. Uh, no, so the third, third group, what do they get first? Uh, let's say something, something else. else, some yeah. other treatment. Okay. And then eventually, in the, the, the secondary treatments, there's another uh, case where you use the same behavior right. model, same, which yeah. I didn't say medicine. Yeah. Is there, does, does the model have any uh, capability to infer the success rate of that uh, based on the topology, or is, are, are these branches completely conditionally independent? Um, again, I mean, if your question is that com com whether combination therapy and behavioral modification therapy. Uh, how, how do they compare among non-responders and without specifying the first stage? So it doesn't matter which first stage treatment they got, you can combine everything together, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I actually asked this question. One's a reflection point and one's a question. So the reflection point I thought wouldn't it be awesome, I think, in the in the mainstream education right now, uh, we, we kind of structured on a Generally, uh, generally generalization principle. I mean, primarily it's a generalization principle of giving everyone one standard treatment. I think just conceptually it's so exciting um, in the sense that you could possibly conceptually apply this so you have smart designs so where people don't just have to be in one classroom, in one year level. And if we only knew our treatments so specifically, for what learning outcomes and it would be so clean and you could really use this dynamic personalization right, right, to right. shift people into learning modes and then there is second chance learning, third right. chance learning, conceptually it's just really exciting. Uh, I, I just I just wish really we could come at such a clean and uh, clear uh, well I guess understanding of or knowledge or confidence of knowing what treatments uh, for what learning outcomes, that's something I think as an education professor we need to work on. The question, so thank you for sharing that work, it was really great. Uh, the, the question I had was um, a lot of people's treatment, uh, response to treatments are, uh, uh, there, as you said, messy variables and social variables are very, social conceptual variables are very hard to capture. Uh, the power of this would be to capture the really micro sort of other confounding variables that interact with the treatment. Right. So maybe I'm not understanding it right, but earlier I saw that you were collecting also variables around right. ed uh, education levels and, uh, and and something else. I, I'm not so sure. Which in education, I mean, SES knocks out a whole lot of the variables. But I wonder how it might apply to are you capturing other contextual variables and including them in that in that context? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, at the design stage, when we are stratifying the people, we are using this responder non-responder kind of categorization, which which I mentioned that it's a very low dimensional summary of that whole covariate space, right? So all these individual characteristics, socioeconomic, and and everything, because if you want to stratify based on all those, then it's a 
tremendously huge, huge tree, right? So you don't want to do that. But when it comes to analysis of the data, of course, uh, you know, you, as you move along in the design, you will collect all those other information. And then once you have the data, you in the analysis stage, you will use all those as confounders and you know effect modifiers if you like. So all these things you can do and in that Q learning method that I mentioned, which is essentially an extension of the regression idea, right? So you put all, all those variables in the model and based on that you can do the personalization. Okay. All right. So I if you mind I just want to make one comment. Um, so yes, I presented on a study where we sent a couple of hundred emails on different subject lines go to different levels of activity. Then we personalize by changing, okay, these emails go to low activity, these go to high. So that kind of fits in with what um, people said with adaptive randomization. But what, I'm, what we've been talking about is how do you actually combine that with different interventions? For example, like what you said, how do you do adaptive randomization but also if something's not working, let's do it again. And so one thing John and I uh, were talking about is um, he's worked on a project where you can actually send people different kind of feedback messages in a course about the technology and quizzes or what they should be reviewing based on some if then rules of what they look to be video for two seconds or 20 seconds. So that may actually be a very nice setting where we can apply these methods to dynamically re-randomize people and figure out how to personalize on, you know, in groups, you know, keep people watch for short or long, you need to get this. But also, if that doesn't work, you can then kind of follow that. Yeah. So just throwing that out as an idea. And so it's a bit of dynamic, uh, a bit of dynamic uh, adjustment. So we actually should be scheduled back. Um, so we figured everyone seems to love the break, so we're actually going to cut a bit of time to lunch. So we'll start it later, but we'll make much of it shorter. So if we can come back in um, uh, the next talk, we'll start at 11.45. When do you guys say you're not? So at 11.45, we'll start.